Well, hello and good morning and welcome to Dwell on Truth. My name is Brenton Powers. If you're listening on KSCO or KOMY live on the radio, it is Sunday morning, 8 a.m., time to get up and get ready for church. I don't think that this is a church service, what we do online. It is an outreach ministry of myself, Brenton Powers, and Dwell on Truth and Open Air Campaigners, the 501c3 I'm a part of as a missionary evangelist here here in Northern California. On today's show, we're going to talk about prayer. From the text that we're in, we're going slowly through the book of Romans. We're in chapter 15. This will be our fifth study in chapter 15 and final study before we head into the last chapter, chapter 16, next week. So we're getting close to the end of the book, and Paul is closing things out with a prayer request, actually multiple prayer requests, and I think we're going to learn something thing about our prayers, as Paul asks us not simply just to pray, but to pray in a certain way, to pray for specific things, and to remember why we pray and what the benefits of prayer are. So if you've ever struggled with prayer, and that's probably 100% of us, because none of us pray enough or always know how to pray. In fact, the Bible itself says we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit helps us. The Holy Spirit has given given us this help in the scriptures of a type of prayer that we should pray. Paul's writing to specific people in Romans, asking them to pray for his specific situation, planning to go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. So let's get back into Romans chapter 15. I'm going to read our four verses we're going to look at today to learn how to pray. It is going to be rich for your spiritual life. Let's get into it. Romans chapter 15, I'm going to read starting in verse 30. I appeal to you, brothers, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Verse 31, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Verse 32, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Verse 33, may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. This week, as we are seeking the Lord's will, the best way to seek it is by searching the scriptures to see what he says and applying it prayerfully. And so on the subject of prayer, Paul here requests prayer. And this is a common thing. If you're a churchgoer, if you were raised in the church, I certainly would invite you to Calvary Chapel Capitola. I'll be there this Sunday. 10 o'clock is when the service begins. I'd love to talk with you afterward, pray with you. But it's a common thing in church to pray. Why? Because Jesus said, when you pray, do it like this. He didn't say if you pray. It's an expectation that as Christians, we have fellowship with God. And one of the ways we commune with God is through prayer. Prayer is talking to God, but it's more than just talking to God. It's requesting things from God, but it's more than just requesting things from God. It's communing with God. It is speaking directly to God, not necessarily giving him directions or information as if he doesn't know already. But prayer is one of those mysteries. If God knows everything and he doesn't change his mind about things, then does prayer change anything? Is prayer powerful in and of itself? You know, sometimes that's a cliche. Prayer is powerful, but if you put your trust in something that cannot answer your prayers, then it's not powerful. If you're praying to Mary, I don't believe that she hears your prayers. We're not allowed in Scripture to pray to the dead. We're called to pray to the Father. That's the biblical precedent. Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father. Now, on that note, if you are not yet born again, you don't have the right to be called a child of God or to call on God as your Father. He's your creator, and he is your judge. But until you're reconciled to God, the first prayer that you should pray is, God, forgive me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. I want to have peace with you in a relationship. Make me born again. I believe Jesus died for my sins, rose again, and I call upon him to be my Lord. I surrender. Until then, the Bible says, God's ear is not deaf that he cannot hear you, but your sins have separated you from God. But Jesus came to call those who are far away and to bring them near, to be our peace, our mediator between us and God. Now Jesus intercedes for us. He prays to the Father for us. 
Yes, Jesus is God the Son. The Father is God the Father. There's one God, and there's communion within the members of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They talk to each other. They love each other. But it's only one being, one essence, one God, yet three persons. So the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. There's perfect love within the Trinity because God is love. And so we enter into a relationship with God, and we can talk to God because He invites us to. Remember to pray confidently, knowing that God commands it. And if God commands us to do something, then we know that it's His will, and He will enable us to do it, and we can be confident that He hears us. The Bible says if we pray according to the will of God, then we know that He hears us. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. So throughout scripture, there are examples of prayer that is according to the will of God. And this should instruct us in how and why and with whom and for whom we pray. So let's get into it from our main text today, Romans 15, verse 3. 30 through 33, starting with just verse 30. Let me reread that, and then I'll draw out my three points from that one verse before moving on. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. That's the verse. There's a lot more than three points that could be drawn out of this, but I've got to keep this short, so I'm summing it up in three ways. Number one, we learn that Paul is requesting prayer as needed. Paul is requesting prayer because he knows he needs it. Do you know that you need prayer? If you need it, we need to ask others to pray for us. It's okay to say, I need prayer. Can you pray for me? That's the way that we do it oftentimes in church. I have a prayer request. We can request things from him, and ultimately, it's up to God. I can request from God my will, but ultimately, as Jesus taught us in his prayer in the garden before he went to the cross, he said, if there's any other way to save the world than going to the cross, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But if not, your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. And that's the posture of prayer, is to present our requests to God. But also in Philippians 4, verse 6, right after saying we should dwell on truth and what is true, what is good, what is noble, he advises in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, God knows what you need, but he doesn't know your requests if you don't make requests. So, how do you let your requests be made known to God? By actually requesting. Requesting them. It's not that he needs anything, it's that he wants something. He wants fellowship with you. It's like I've given this illustration before. Um, before my daughter got her license, she wanted to hang out with her friends. And so she'd come to me and tell me, hey, my friends want to hang out in Monterey on such such a night, such such a time. I said, okay. And I know she's wanting a ride to get there, but she hasn't asked me for a ride. She's informed me of a fact, but I would like her to request from me, not just assume that I'm just going to do whatever and you know read her mind. I would like that conversation to happen, to have the request, to be given the choice to say yes or no, and then to have have my favor be recognized that she's asking a favor of me. And I can be gracious and say yes. But if it's just like, hey, you better do this, like, well, wait, why am I, why do I owe that to you? But it's part of a relationship to request things and then give people the option to say yes, no, or wait. God ultimately does answer all prayers, yes, no, or wait. You might not hear the answer, but if it's a specific prayer request, it's measurable. You can see whether God answers in the affirmative or it's just silence and you you don't see the request being granted. So the point is here, Paul gives a prayer request in a very urgent way. He doesn't ask simply, but he builds in all of these relational aspects Back in Romans 15, verse 30, he says, I appeal to you, brothers. You're my brothers in the faith. He's writing to Christians. 
from the beginning of the letter. He said, I pray for you that I may bring you a blessing when I come visit you. At the end of the letter, he's saying, I want to come visit you, but I appeal to you, brothers, please pray for my journey to get there. Because as he had said in the previous verses, he has a plan to go from where he's writing Romans from, which I believe is Corinth, Greece writing, and then he's going to Jerusalem, and then he hopes to go to Rome on his way to Spain. So, it's it's part of a bigger picture. He's requesting prayer for his traveling mercies. That's a bullet point prayer we often ask for, and you can add that to your prayer request. Traveling mercies. What does that mean? That you'll be kept safe, that you'll be able to get to where you want to go without hindrance, as Paul is on missionary journeys. If it's God's will for you to go places, specifically on a mission trip, then we need to ask for prayer because God said, I will be with you when you go make disciples throughout all the earth in every nation. And so we got to keep that in mind as we go and step out to serve God, that we're not just doing it for God, but we're doing it with God, and we need His help in order to have success. But it's very relational. His request is very directed. Now notice who He's directing these prayers to, and how, this is my second point, how are we to pray? How were the Romans to pray for Paul, and how are we to pray today? There's a, it's not just a flippant, oh God, give world peace, you know, fix all the problems in the world. Answer all the prayers. <laughs> but specifically, he appeals to them, which is a strong emotional term. How are they to pray? By our Lord Jesus and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers. So there's effort that goes into it. There's love that goes into it. There's the help of the Holy Spirit that needs to go into it. And there's Jesus himself that somehow we pray by our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? To pray by by the Lord Jesus. Well, when we do something by his name, in his name, we're doing so in his character, by his will, under his lordship, with him as our mediator that brings us to God. By the blood of Jesus Christ, we have access to God and we can pray confidently knowing that God will hear our prayers. And he only hears our prayers by Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus Christ, he has no obligation to hear or answer our prayers. Now, he's gracious. He may answer the prayer of a non-believer, but it would be in leading him to Christ, not in affirming that he's okay without Christ. So, we pray by Jesus Christ, Secondly, we pray by the love of the Spirit. You know, one of the biggest motivators to pray is the love that the Holy Spirit pours out in our hearts. The Bible says that the love of the, of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Why would I care enough to take the time to pray for somebody? Because the Holy Spirit is in my heart, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of love. And if I have the Holy Spirit, the supreme evidence that I know Him and that I'm walking with Him is that there is love in my life. It is one of the fruits of the Spirit. So, as we're motivated by that love. And as we have peace with God and access to God by Jesus Christ, we can pray. Now, with whom should we pray? Paul says, together with me in your prayers. He doesn't just say, hey, pray for me. I'm not going to pray for myself. He's already praying for himself, but he needs other people to join in with him. Why? Well, Jesus said, whenever two or three on earth agree as touching a matter, when you have two or three witnesses, a matter shall be established. Whenever two or three are gathered in his name, he is there in their midst. There's a principle of when you have a plurality of prayers, people who pray, then you have more power. You have established something. Now, if you ask someone to pray for something that's not God's will, and they don't believe it's God's will, they're not going to pray that for you. Oh, would you pray that I win the lottery? It would be great to win a billion dollars. Well, a person might pray that for themselves, but is anyone else going to pray that for them? Um, it, the Bible says, in James that we have not because we ask not. That may be one reason God doesn't hear your prayers, because you don't ask. But about the billion-dollar lottery ticket, it, and maybe this verse applies that, and when you ask, you ask that you may spend it on your pleasures, and that's why God doesn't answer your prayers. But when we ask other people to pray, you know, we we get the sense we should pray for something more noble, something more moral, something right. Our prayer requests may be less selfish if we're 
asking others to pray for it, we should think about, well, is it in their best interest that they pray for that? Is it really necessary? And they may help you filter out the more selfish aspects of your prayer. If we're asking for God's will for ourselves, that is what's best for us, but ultimately it's what's best for the world as well. God's will is not just for us as an individual. God's will is for all to come to repentance. The more we know God's will, the more we'll be informed in how to pray. So here in verse 30, the first point was we need to request prayer. The second point was we learn how to pray, by whom, by what, and how to strive together in our prayers. It will take work, and this is maybe one of the reasons why we don't pray enough. It takes concentration, focus. God will hear your prayers by Jesus Christ, by the love of the Spirit, but it is a spiritual exercise and discipline. And it's something, as a if you're a new believer, I encourage you to develop that discipline. It's good for you. That's one of the ways that you grow, is by praying. So, number one, request prayer. Number two, pray by Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit fervently. Number three, remember with whom and for whom you are praying. Now, in this case, Paul's asking prayer for himself, that they would do it together with the church. He's writing to Christians in Rome. So there's already a believing community there, and we'll list the names of all the different uh, home groups and stuff that they have there next week. So let me make an application today. We don't need to pray for Paul. Paul's in heaven. Paul's completed all of his missionary journeys, but at this point in time, Paul is an example of a missionary asking for prayer. And so I am a missionary. I have in my notes some bullet points of prayer that I would ask you to pray for, those who are in my listening audience. Some of you know me in person. Some of you have been listening for a while. And um, maybe you've called in on the Flight 1080 show when I've been there. Um, That's not necessarily the platform I want to use to ask for prayer. Normally, I ask for prayer for my men's group on Tuesday nights. We pray for each other. I pray with my family. I go to my pastors to ask for prayer when things come up where I need healing or wisdom or just uh, to pray for the ministries. But if you're a regular listener here, I would ask you right now, please pray for me in a similar vein like Paul prayed and Paul asked people to join him in prayer. I'm praying for my outreach teams in Monterey, Capitola, Salinas, San Jose, um, Pray for me and Dan Bodwin with Open Air Campaigners. What specifically? Well, similar things to what Paul's going to ask prayer for um, in the following verse. But um, know that we are praying that, as I've stated earlier, that God's will will be done in terms of all coming to repentance. That's God's will, not that any would perish. Now, if I just pray, God, save the whole world, make everyone repent, he doesn't answer that prayer. There is an element of human will, I believe. He calls all people people to repent, and he calls people through us as evangelists, repent and believe the gospel, and we define repentance as a change of mind that leads to a change in direction. It's to rethink, to reconsider, and to think over things in such a way as to change. And so, from unbelief to belief, the second part of our call when we preach the gospel is believe the gospel. Believe in this Jesus whom we've told you about, who lived a sinless life, who died on the cross for your sins and mine, who rose from the grave on the third day and appeared to hundreds of eyewitnesses. Many of them wrote the Bible, the New Testament. And so we have reliable eyewitness testimony. Therefore, repent of your unbelief, turn to Christ, turn to the Savior, and live. So we pray that people will respond. We pray that the Holy Spirit will do what he did in the book of Acts, that he'll do it today. Like when Paul preached to the women in Philippi, God opened the mind and heart of Lydia and her friends to respond to the things that he had spoken. And so pray that for us. Pray that those who hear us when we go out to preach the gospel in Monterey and Capitola, which are the most regular outreaches I have, pray that we would see people responding. Not necessarily, I don't have to see them, but we would like that. If it's God's will, we would like to see people's hearts and minds open and change instantly. Um, On that note, we do see it happen sometimes for people to follow up who seem like they're right on the verge of changing their lives. I got a text from one of the women in our outreach team this morning, and she said that she has a praise report. This is answer to prayer, and this is awesome to be able to to see how God answers prayer. One of the women that she had shared with had a bit of a drinking problem, in her own words, and she thought it would be great to share this with her, and and, and she shared it with me. So she said, 
Thank you, because in the last couple of weeks, you have truly opened my eyes and heart to the Lord more than I ever have. I really appreciate everything that you have done for me and told me over this course of two weeks. Thank you for believing and praying for me. You truly are a gift from God, and I will forever be blessed because of that. I will see you on Sunday. Have a blessed rest of the night and Saturday. So that was cool. Similarly, I met somebody on Wednesday, and on Friday he said, hey, thank you so much for what you talked to me about. You really gave me something to think about, and I think it changed my mind. But uh, what is your radio show address? How can I find that? I want to listen more. So that was just in the process of some AV work I was doing while we had some downtime I was talking to a coworker. Um, and so he thanked me for what I shared, and it was great to have him say that. You know, it's nice to know that you're making a difference. You want to invest your time and efforts in a way that where you're making a difference. Sometimes we don't get to see the difference. Preaching the gospel, honestly, and most of the time when we do evangelize out on the streets or with people we know, we do a lot of seed sowing. As Jesus said, a sower goes out to sow the seed and it falls on different kinds of soil, which are different kinds of hearts. Some people have soft hearts and they're receptive to that seed and eventually it will grow and produce fruit and multiply. That's success. The the fruit of someone becoming a Christian, getting saved, growing as a Christian and being fruitful, having the love of God manifest in their life, and then they begin to witness to others. That ripple effect we consider successful, but it doesn't all happen instantly. We don't always get to see it. The day that we plant the seed, it's not the day that we reap the fruit. But we don't always get to follow up. When we do, it's awesome. But we pray, this is another prayer request, that those who hear us may get connected with local churches who will be able to follow up. I have heard of those who joined Calvary Chapel Capitola as a result of our outreaches. I've heard of and seen people come to Calvary Monterey as a result of our outreaches. And um, some people are close or on the fence, and I need to follow up with them. But we need to pray for them as well. Because the devil would like to keep people away from the church, because that's where there's powerful fellowship, prayer, Bible teaching, and just that's the best place to go to grow. Because it's not just a place. The church is the people. People we pray for, people that pray for us, people to pray with, and people to praise God for and with, because God answers prayer. All right, enough personal application for now. We'll, we'll come back to more specific prayer requests for me, but let's see what Paul's specific prayer requests for him was in the next verse, Romans 15, verse 31. Romans chapter 15 and verse 31. Here's his specific prayer requests. That I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. In verse 32, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. So in verse 31, there are two bullet point prayer requests request. If you were to put them on a list, you put a little point and you can write down, the church in Rome could write this down, pray for Paul to be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. What does he mean by that? Well, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He, being a Jew, has been preaching the gospel where God sent him in the uh, Greek-speaking world, um, and there's been a contingent of Jews that rejected Jesus. There were some that accepted him and followed Jesus with Paul, but there were some who were apathetic and just ignored Paul and moved on, but there were some who were persecutors. He was persecuted. He was followed. He was accused of things. He was thrown in jail. He was um, in danger of these Jews who were trying to get him not just in trouble to be jailed, arrested, but to be killed. Um, and so, as he's going to Jerusalem, there's, you know, Jesus said about Jerusalem, which of the prophets did your fathers not murder? So, he knows there's a risk of being killed by the Jews. There was already plots formed against him in the in the outer areas of Israel and the Roman Empire, everywhere he went, that jealous Jews were um, were seeking to do him harm. And out of one city, he had to be led out of the city walls through a window 
in a basket and lowered down so he could escape. Other times he was stoned and dragged out of the city as if he was dead, but he came back to life. God delivered him from all of those previous occasions, but on this trip to Jerusalem, you could read about this in the book of Acts. Paul said in Acts 20, when he was saying his goodbyes to the people in Ephesus, the leaders in Ephesus, he said, I don't know what's going to happen to me exactly, but I know that everywhere I go, the Holy Spirit is warning me that chains and afflictions await me. And people said, well, then that means you shouldn't go. But they couldn't persuade Paul. Paul was ready to die for the gospel, but he asked for prayer. Here's the point today. He asked for prayer that he wouldn't die. He would asked for prayer that he would be delivered from the plots of the Jews, from the accusations of the Jews, from the murderous threats of the Jews, and, um, you know, the, the who wields the sword at this point in time in Jerusalem? It's the centurion guards. So, what we read in the book of Acts is a little spoiler alert. He does go to Jerusalem, in spite of all of the uh, pleadings of Christians who are like, no, don't go there, you're going to get arrested. Even a prophet saying, give me your belt. And then he binds himself and he says, in this way, the owner of this belt will be bound. And so, he knows he's going to get arrested, but he prays for deliverance. Now, interestingly, God uses the arrest to deliver him from the Jews because there was this mob that formed. When he went to Jerusalem, he tried to tick all the boxes to be socially acceptable, to be religiously clean, to be, um, you know, like he said, when I'm with those who are under the law, I become like one under the law, though I'm not under the law. I live as if I am. So he committed this uh, Nazarite type of vow where he would cut his hair. He shaved his head with some other brothers, and he went through some rites of purification in order to be culturally sensitive there in Jerusalem. And he brought a huge offering from churches that were giving money to help support the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Many of them were poor because they had sold houses and goods, and there was a famine, and there was persecution. And so the holdovers, those who didn't flee from Jerusalem, were really going through a hard time. And he brought an offering to the church there to distribute to those who had need, as they had already been doing. And uh, we talked about that last time at the end of our, our study, that it was a right thing to do for the churches around the world to give to the church that where it all started in Jerusalem. And so Paul brought gifts, and yet in spite of his efforts to not cause any conflict, there were people of conflict that made false accusations. They said, he's bringing Gentiles into the temple, um, which isn't true. He brought uh, Gentiles with him to the uh, court of the Gentiles, but he didn't bring them in to the uh, court that's only for uh, Jewish people, and he didn't go into the holy place. Holy of Holies either. But their accusation, nonetheless, riled up a crowd and almost caused a riot. And this drew the attention of the Roman centurions and guards who said, this must be that Alexandrian who's trying to uh, cause an insurrection. And so there was, they arrested him and started taking him away from this crowd. And he addressed the Romans in a, not in an Alexandrian accent or language, but in, in Greek. And they said, oh, you speak Greek? He said, yeah, I'm a Roman citizen. Is it lawful for you to bind someone like this and whip them uh, without a trial? And they were like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. We, and they're like, you're not the Alexandrian that caused the uh, it, tried to cause an insurrection? He said, no. And so um, they secured him, and God uh, continued to protect him while he was in prison, even though the Roman, the, the Jews who wanted him killed were saying, you know, turn him over. This guy should be, you know, erased from, deleted from the earth. He's not fit to live. Their charges were, they need, there needed to be a trial. And yet, through the years that Paul was in prison, getting trial after trial, being um, passed off to different governors and kings. Ultimately, he had to appeal to Caesar because there was a point in time where there was a plot that, that these Jews were so intent on having him killed that they made a vow that they would not eat or drink until they killed him. And they asked that he would be transported from one prison to another. And they had like 300 men. I don't remember if that's the exact number. You can find it in the book of Acts that were going to ambush the few soldiers that were going to transport Paul from one place, holding place to another where he'd be vulnerable. But miraculously, this prayer request that I'm sure the Romans prayed was answered. He was delivered from the Jews in that case by his nephew of all people, happened to be in the right place at the right 
right time to hear this conspiracy that he was they were they were, were vowing that they would not eat or drink until they killed Paul and this is what when they were going to attack and that nephew brought word to Paul and Paul told the authorities, hey, you better not um, bring me to Jerusalem from this cell so to be tried there because there's an ambush that's about to happen. So that increased the amount of security security that he got, and they didn't deliver him into the hands of the Jews who were ready to kill him. Now, when I say that, I've got to clarify, most Jews were not wanting to kill him. It was just a few hundred. <laughs> but if you had a few hundred people wanting to kill you, wouldn't you ask for prayer for protection? protection for de- from deliverance. And it's interesting Paul didn't say, "Oh, you know, pray that I'll, I'll I'll be able to do something else less dangerous." He didn't choose a less dangerous profession. He knew there were risks. He was willing to accept the risks, but he committed the risks to God. And that's what we should do. There's an application directly today for me. Um I, I've told this story rarely a few occasions on the radio. And I'll do it again. Um, I have been assaulted twice in the last 25 years of preaching the gospel, but it wasn't in Jerusalem when I preached there. It wasn't in Rome when I was a Bible college student and I shared with a few people there. It wasn't on my journeys or living in Latvia or Ukraine or visiting Russia or Romania for a couple of weeks or the two years I spent in Hungary and went out preaching the gospel there or on my journeys through airports or on airplanes sharing the gospel with people people where we went. I had never been assaulted in Europe on my missionary journeys when I was often preaching alone, but I have been assaulted twice here on the Central Coast. Once was in Monterey. That was one time I was assaulted. And then not much later after that, maybe six to eight months later, in February, I was in Capitola. There was a couple with a son that had, uh, the wife certainly had been drinking. She was already mocking and and, uh, being belligerent about my Christian art that I had there. And I wasn't even open air preaching there. I was just painting, preparing a sketch for future outreaches. And I had a sign that said, got questions? Ask. She didn't ask respectful questions. She said, oh, I want to drink with Jesus, because I had another painting up that said, Jesus said, all who are thirsty, come to me and drink, and out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And she was drinking a beer, and she poured out some of her beer on the ground right next to me where I was painting. And I said, well, if you're going to be disrespectful, I don't want to talk with you. And I turned and kept painting. Well, after Pastor Dave left, they were getting ready to leave, and she knocked over my sketch that where it's, Jesus had that quote there. I had a painting of Jesus and a sunset, and she knocked over the stand that it was on. And I heard it fall. I didn't see her push it over, but I saw it on the ground, and I said, did you push it down? Because she was walking away from it. She said, yeah, and I'll do it again uh, as I was putting it up. And she went and got in front of me and knocked it over again. I backed away, and she proceeded to push my guitar off of the flood wall there, the retaining wall, onto the beach. It was in a case, so thankfully it didn't get damaged. Neither did my painting on the uh, stand, but my painting on the rock wall, on the cement wall that I had been working on for like three hours, she grabbed it and ripped it and threw it down. And the part where she grabbed was the corners. It ripped out from where it had been like held down by some rocks so the wind would blow it away. It ripped on the corners. It also, she grabbed the face of Jesus that I had painted in the lower right corner. There was a tear right in the middle of his face. So I think it was demonic. And I, I said as much, this is demonic. It's not okay for you to s- destroy my property. Thankfully, there was a crowd of young people, mostly teenagers, that jumped in and helped pick up my art and my guitar and my um, painting stand. I backed away and I was going to go take a picture of their license plate. Husband was already in the truck that was parked right there, super close to where I've, I was painting. So I was going to go around the back to take a picture. He jumped out of the truck and charged me and said, you're not going to get a picture of my... Boom! He hit the phone out of my hand, body slammed, you know, like a like a hockey player, hit into my left side, kicked my leg, and knocked the wind out of me and the phone out of my hand. And then he picked up my phone... Now, for, fortunately, I did take a picture right then as his fist was coming at me. I got a picture of him and his girlfriend or wife. I don't know. Um, she was coming around the back of the truck to also, like, uh, I guess she got away from the crowd of Good Samaritans. She was probably going to attack me too. But then he picked her up and threw her in the truck, said, get in the car, we're going. So God delivered me from that. But since then, long story short, you're wondering, did, what did I do? Did I press charges for assault? I was going to this time. They fled the scene. 
scene. I got a picture of their license plate before they left with my other phone because my iPhone was damaged. But praise God, there happened to be someone there from Calvary Chapel, San Jose. And he said, hey, I saw what happened and I want to buy you a new phone if you need it. I want you to keep doing what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. I want to encourage you. So I'll, here's my number. And he, true to his word, he, I didn't need a new phone. I just needed the screen and LCD fixed. 250 bucks later, he sent me the money. And I had told this couple, look, if you apologize, I'll forgive you. But this is a crime, what you're doing. Um, and their son actually apologized. Their 10 or 11-year-old son said, I'm sorry for what my parents are doing. And he told the bystanders, I'm not comfortable getting in the car. And they were like, well, let him walk home or something. And they're like, don't tell us what to do with our kid. Cursing as well. Um, Very sad for the kid. But because of that, and because I took the time to pray and ask people to pray for me to know what to do, and the scriptures encouraged me to forgive because I've done so much more against God um, than these people had done against me. And so if God's forgiven me so much, and their son did apologize, I did get an apology, not from either of the parents, but from the kid. For, so for the kid's sake, I decided to write this to the DA when I got the letter asking how much do I want to seek for restitution. I said, because the son interceded and, and the debt has been paid, I forgive them in Jesus' name. And I don't want to press charges anymore. There was a box I could check for that. I don't. I no longer wish to press charges or have them tried for assault. So it was a hard thing to do, and it's still hard to talk about it, which is why I'm giving this prayer request. And sorry this is going so long, but it's a real story. And I, since then, have been asking for prayer. Would you pray that God would not only protect me, but protect those who go with me? I think there is safety in numbers. They might, they may have been waiting for me to be alone before acting like that. And it's also firmed up a conviction in me that God's called me not to try to be by myself, but he's called me to be an evangelist. And evangelists are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. How are they going to do that unless they are out there with me, watching, learning, practicing, practicing, doing the work of an evangelist with me. It's a team effort. The church is all called, all of us are called together to be part of preaching the gospel to every person, making disciples of every nation. And one man cannot do it alone. I'm thankful for all the missionaries that I know. They're doing this in different parts of the world. This is the part of the world I'm called to do it in, but I'm called to do it not alone, but with the local church and with some other people on our team that God has a plan for them. So we got to do it together. Let's pray together. Let's reach out to the world together. There's power when we are together in Jesus' name. All right, I'm going to continue on. We got two more verses to cover. We're halfway through our text, but we only have a few more minutes of time for the show. So let me quickly cover... Paul's second bullet point prayer request in verse 31, Romans 15, 31, B, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So not only was he praying, A, for deliverance from the unbelievers who wish to do him harm, that's prayer request A, and but he was also praying, prayer request B, that his service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So there's two groups of people he wanted people to pray for his relationship with them, both those who opposed him from the unbelieving world and those who were to receive something from Paul from the believing world. His, what was his service that he was offering for Jerusalem to the saints? Well, it was a financial gift for the poor, but it was also his desire to serve as he's an evangelist, a missionary, an apostle, to preach the gospel to those who were like him, to share his testimony of how he was once a persecutor and a violent man, and yet Jesus appeared to him and called him to a new life. And so the prayer request for believers, your ministry to non-believers, you should pray for that, pray for my ministry to non-believers, not just that I'd be protected from them, but that they would be saved from that violence of rejecting God and from the consequences that come with that. I I fear more for them what's going to happen to them after they die than what could possibly happen to me in this life. Jesus said, don't fear him who can kill your body and afterward has no power, but fear him who can, after killing your body, cast your soul into hell. Who is him that can kill our body and cast our souls into hell? Well, that's God. God is the judge. God can take our life. He gave us life. He can take it. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Fear the Lord. Um, so that motivates me to evangelize the fear of God. And we ought to pray 
for non-believers to to get it, to repent, to be saved. To, but we also ought to pray for believers to receive the ministry that God wants to give them. You know, why wouldn't they receive it? Well, it's money. Well, some people out of pride don't want to receive a financial gift. Maybe they felt like it, their physical needs were not as important as spiritual needs. And Paul was out preaching the gospel. Maybe they felt like he should keep the money and because he was not receiving support from most churches for his ministry. And he knew what it was to be in want, to have plenty, or to be lacking. He knew both extremes. So maybe it was to that the prayer was that they would be humble enough to accept it. Um, maybe it was a holdover from those who didn't really believe in, initially that Paul was a true Christian when he was a a new convert, they said, maybe he's just posing as a Christian. He's really coming here to arrest us. I don't know for a fact if, if any Christian still had any misgivings about Paul's background, but he did want his service to be acceptable to the saints. Maybe he's talking about the way that he approached that he would be humble enough to submit to the request for cultural sensitivity and contextualizing the gospel in Jerusalem, that the Christians there wouldn't say, oh, Paul preaches a different gospel, a gospel to the Gentiles, and that's not the true one. One for us Jews, as some people do today, they may, they say there's two different gospels, but I don't believe there is. There's one gospel, just like Paul said in Galatians. If anyone preaches to you another gospel than what we preach to you, let them be accursed. Paul explained to the Corinthians in chapter 15, this is the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that on the third day he rose again. He preached the cross and Christ crucified. He preached thoroughly in the book of Acts, all kinds of uh, important points in the gospel. Perhaps he was referring to that when he said, pray that the saints would accept his ministry. Because there were some Jews that still held to traditions and they were on the verge of accepting um, the idea that and for new believers, you have to be circumcised to be saved. If you're a Jew, if you're a Jew preaching to Gentiles, there were some Jews preaching that. And there was a, I'm not sure if this happened after or before Paul wrote Romans, but in Acts chapter 15, there was a church council when Paul went to Jerusalem. I think it was before he wrote Romans. But anyway, background is important. They met about that question. Do Gentiles need to be circumcised and obey the whole law of Moses to be saved? Paul argued no. The Judaizers argued yes. Peter said, I've already seen them saved apart from that, so certainly not. They don't need to be. It's by the grace of God that we are saved. And why do you put a burden on their shoulders that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? Namely, fulfilling the law to be saved, is that's legalism. You can't bear that weight. No one can be justified by the deeds of the law. So Paul made a lot of um, effort to make sure that Christians accepted that truth as gospel truth. So maybe that's what he's asking for prayer for. Pray that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. He wasn't there with a bribe to get people to accept a, a grace gospel. He was there with a gift because the gospel is the gospel of grace. God's unmerited favor. God God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is. So pray for Christians to maintain a biblical gospel of grace. Um, there's movements today in churches where people are afraid of um, being accused of being anti-moral or antinomian against the law um, and are speaking down on the gospel of grace and so-called grace preachers that um, they make a distinction. So uh, I'm, I'm, I need to pray for this regarding some churches um, that I know that kind of lean to the emphasizing obedience a bit too much, in my opinion, and don't emphasize the grace of God that not only forgives our sin, but empowers us to not sin. So, properly understood, the grace of God and the gospel that teaches we're saved by grace and we grow by grace, we want that service, that ministry to be acceptable to the saints. And if we believe the Bible, if we say we believe the Bible, we got to believe what the Bible says about grace versus legalism. So, watch out. There are legalistic churches out there, and the Bible has enough to say about that. We'll leave that for another study. But for now, let me read our final two verses here. Now that we're done with Paul's two bullet point prayers, and we've applied it to our lives in uh, praying for those who preach the gospel to non-believers and teach the truth to believers, we want those messages to be received. What is the end goal? In verse 32, Paul reminds 
reminds us why we pray these things. What is the goal and the heart behind these relational prayer requests? You know, pray for me as I go to these people and those people. Pray for these relationships. Why do we pray for relationships? Well, he says in verse 32 of Romans chapter 15, so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Read that again. So that, this is why we pray these ways. So that by God's will, so let me pause on that. We pray so that God's will will be done. We want his will, we ask for his will to be done, and we pray that his will would be done because his will will produce the best result. When we surrender to his will, prayer is a way of saying, God, this is my will, but we pray that your will be done regarding this. I'm asking this request, and you will, I, I, and I'm trusting that you will answer according to your will. So, by God's will, we pray that it would be possible for Paul, says, I may come to you. So, there's a chance that he may not be able to come to Rome, as he's been pre- prevented before because of the work that he had to do. Um, but pray that I may come to you, by God's will, in a certain way. He says, with joy, and be refreshed in your company. So, may, I, may my approach be a joyful one, not a burdensome one. May I come to you having joy in myself, because God has paved the way for me to come to you, and, and you know, that is one thing we ought to pray for, is for, you know, the, the obstacles to be removed, for us to get to where God wants us to go. Um, and that does affect our mood, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't have to. Paul can Paul is asking for prayer that he would have joy no matter how he comes to Rome in the will of God. He hopes that it would be as a free man, you know, hiring a ship, getting to Rome uh, on his own terms, in his own schedule. But how it ends up happening is he comes as a prisoner, not free. He comes on multiple ships um, in terrible weather, and one ship had a shipwreck on Malta before he even reached Rome. He came to Rome having to appeal to Caesar as the only way to get to Rome and the only way to get out of jail because uh, alive, the only way to get out of um, this threat was to come to Rome appealing to Caesar as a prisoner. But he got there. And when he got there, the last chapter of the book of Acts records that he met believers there. Probably some of these same people that he's going to greet in our study next week in Romans chapter 16. But let me read the last chapter of Acts that records the answer to this prayer. Did Paul come to Rome with joy in the way that God willed him to come as they prayed? In Acts 28 verse 11, it says, after three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered on the island of Malta, a ship of Alexandria. Let me skip forward to when he arrived to Putioli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. He got there. That's part of the prayer request. How did he get there? How did he feel? Verse 15, and the brothers came, and the brothers were there, and when they heard about us, they came as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. I'd say that's a joyful feeling. Paul thanked God and and was encouraged. And when they came to Rome, when we came to Rome, so Luke is with him, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with this soldier who guarded him. So in other words, he was under house arrest. He was allowed to stay not in a prison this time or in a cell, which he would be later in life, um, toward the end of his life. He would be in a dark, cold cell. Here he stayed in a home and just was chained to a soldier until while he was waiting to be seen by Caesar. And it says in verse 17... (coughs) Acts 28, 17, after three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he told them, brothers, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Well, there's another answer to prayer. He was delivered as a prisoner. Verse 18, when they had examined me, they wished to set me free at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. He's saying, I'm not against the Jews or Israel. I'm not here to get Israel in trouble. I'm here because there was no other way out. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel, referring to the resurrection, that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, we have not received letters from Judea, and none of the brothers coming here have reported or spoken any evil about 
about you, but we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers from morning till evening, and he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. In other words, the whole Old Testament. He was proving that Jesus is the Christ. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. That's a pretty common response, right? Some believed, some didn't, but praise God, some believed. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul made one more statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull with their eyes, uh, with and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you, this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years in Rome in his own at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That's the end of the book of Acts. And as we're getting toward the end of the book of Romans, we see that God answers prayer. So let's pray. In conclusion, let's pray specifically with specific prayer requests because we need to ask others to pray. Let's pray by the power of the Spirit, by the blood of Jesus, with other saints, for other saints, for protection from non-believers, but for success in reaching non-believers and helping new believers grow. Let's pray. Why? Because of God's will for the gospel to be received, for Christians to grow, for our relationships with Him. That's why we pray for fellowship with Him. That's what He wants from us. He wants us to talk to Him. He wants to talk to us through His Word, through the Spirit. Let's pray because it's relational. Our relationship with God is imp- improved. Our relationship with each other is improved. Our own internal mood is improved as we seek God's will with joy and for peace. And so let's close in prayer. As Paul closes this little section with a blessing, let me read it and then pray a blessing on you, my listeners. Romans 15, 33. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So as we close, let's close in prayer. God, I thank you that you are the God of peace, that you brought Paul safely through the storms, persecution, and even through his death after writing 13 letters to the church in the New Testament that you inspired. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring this section here, this prayer request section that teaches us how we ought to pray. And so, Lord, help us to put it into practice. And I pray for those listeners of mine, whether they've been listening to to the show for a long time, whether they know me in person or not. If this is their first time listening, they just happen to tune in right now. I pray that the listeners here would surrender to you, God, because you so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. Pray that they would receive your Son and receive life through him. Thank you that he died for our sins and rose from the grave to defeat the problem of sin that separated us from you. So I pray that, Lord, for these, that my heart goes out to these non-believers who are becoming believers right now. Let me address them. As they, as, as, if, as you're listening to this right now, have you ever prayed and ask God yourself to forgive you of your sins? Have you ever told him that you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the grave? Let's do it now. You can do it in your own words or you can repeat after me. Heavenly Father, please accept me as your child because I believe now that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the grave. I repent. I change my mind about my sin. Please forgive me and help me to live for you. I trust you to give me eternal life because you've promised it to all who believe in your son. Pray in Jesus' name and give me the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that pleases you. We pray for joy. We pray for deliverance from those who preach the gospel, for those who preach the gospel, from those who oppose the gospel. And I pray for myself, Brenton, that you would give me protection, that you would deliver me from evil people that would seek to do me harm or shut me down or keep me quiet. Lord, also deliver me from accepting any work that would compromise my values 
Help me to use my audiovisual skills to keep this radio show going. Give me the time and energy and opportunity to keep this show going, if it's your will. Lord, may your will, not my will, be done. So help us all, Lord, to be surrendered to your will and to experience the peace and joy that comes from doing your will. Thank you that as we go, make disciples, preaching the gospel, that you promised to be with us. That as we pray, you promised to be with us in our midst. So thank you for your presence. Help us to be more aware that you're omnipresent, but that you're especially present and eminent, and that your return is coming soon. Could be today, could be tomorrow, could be in a hundred years, but Lord, help us to endure to the end until you take us home. And may your name be glorified. Lord, help us to lift up your name, both with our words and with our actions. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What does amen mean? Truly, truly. It's a Hebrew word. If you agree that it's true, you say amen. If you agree with these requests, you say amen. And whenever two or three agree, especially when God agrees, that's when we know these prayers are going to be answered. So may God bless you as you continue to dwell on truth. Tune in again next week. Plan to continue teaching through Romans. We got one more chapter left. It may take one, two, or three weeks, but I also have in October some missionaries I hope to interview. So subscribe to the Dwell on Truth podcast to make sure that you don't miss an episode. You can re-listen to this if you like, and please let me hear from you. How can I pray for you? Do you have specific prayer requests? Here is where you can ask for prayer. Questions at dwellontruth.org. Now, I've recently given access to this email to Pastor Dave Campbell of Calvary Chapel Capitola, and he has my permission to, in the event of my death, to answer these prayer requests and pray for you or answer questions. Um, But also while I'm alive, if you have a prayer request for Pastor Dave, you can submit it there as well. Questions at dwellontruth.org. And there's more information about this ministry at dwellontruth.org. I'm Brenton Powers. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for praying for me and supporting this ministry. If you wish to give, you can go to dwellontruth.org slash give and find out ways that you can give tax deductibly. It's up to you. May God bless you as you continue to dwell on truth.